So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Lynn Patrick. I'm here with Dr. Louise Tolsman and Dr. Walter Crinian. Uh, we are going to be talking about wildfire smoke, challenges and solutions for human exposure. Uh, you all probably received a graphic that looks somewhat like this in your email. Um, we are a group of providers who uh, practice environmental medicine. I'm going to be introducing Dr. Crinian and Dr. Tolsman in a minute talk to you about their specialty areas, but what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk very specifically about identifying the toxicants that were in the wildfire, that was in the wildfire smoke, toxicants in the wildfire smoke, wildfire smoke that California residents were exposed to in November. Uh, we're going to talk about the risks associated with those exposures, and then most importantly, and the reason you're all on this webinar, is we're going to talk about what providers can do right now to minimize the damage. There was an article from the Center for Investigative Reporting that some of you may or may not have read that accompanied this um, email asking you to come to this webinar that looked at emergency room visits for the period of 2015 post um, the fire in Northern California and looked at the 20% increase in um, ER visits that was sustained for a period 90 days post. Now, of course, there's a PTSD, of course, attached to these exposures, um, but really uh, these visits were related to uh, cardiopulmonary problems, uh, not just um, stress. So uh, Dr. Louise Tolsman, graduate of Leicester University. Um, she specializes in oncology and environmental medicine, uh, but she very specifically specializes in working with firefighters and some of their exposures. She works with the uh, firefighters in um, the state of Washington, and we're talking about residential firefighters, not specifically wild firefighters, but now that line is becoming pretty blurred, as you can imagine, from the recent fires in Northern and Southern California. Um, Dr. Walter Crinian, who is uh, considered one of the fathers of environmental medicine in the United States, recently uh, published a textbook co-authored with Dr. Joe Pizzorno, the Clinical Textbook of Environmental Medicine, um, and has been faculty at several naturopathic medical schools uh, in the area of environmental medicine and um, I am also uh, specializing in environmental medicine and uh, speak and lecture uh, and teach in that area for many, many years. We, let's see, I need to um, advance my slide, Sarah. Is there a way for me to do that? That's not specifically shown here, because they're not advancing. You would advance your slide in your PowerPoint. Um, well, I would okay. love to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm full screen, so I'm not able to do that. I can do it this way, but I'm also not able to escape from the full screen. So I'm hoping since you're producing this webinar, you can help us. There you go. Yeah, did you do that for me? No. Thank you very much. So um, I want to talk about our partnerships for this webinar. Um, this webinar would not be possible without our partnership with the Environmental Health Symposium. That's an annual conference in environmental medicine that Dr. Crinian and I participate in and uh, basically help coordinate this year. Coming up in April, we're going to be talking about endocrine disruption. We're going to have speakers from all over the globe who specialize in the field of endocrine disruption. Uh, and very specifically, that is uh, focusing on what we all see in the waiting room, cardiometabolic disease, obesity, infertility, uh, and more. So there's a live link there. If you just uh, click on EHS 2019 or right click, if you're on a Mac like myself, um, you'll be taken to uh, the EHS website where you can find out um, more about um, EHS. Um, this particular uh, conference is going to be very directly uh, clinically oriented. We're going to have a lot of clinicians present cases related to endocrine disruption, um, including things like fatty liver disease, you know, thyroid disease, which are directly related to environmental toxicant exposures. 
Um, our other partner is the Naturopathic Academy of Environmental Medicine, Dr. Kuni and Dr. Tolzman and myself um, are all members. Uh, we just did a clinical training in uh, Irvine, California um, uh, that now uh, we have recordings for. So if you want to get a hold of those PowerPoint lectures um, that are, uh, uh, there's audio along with the PowerPoints, you can actually link to our website. Uh, naturopathicenvironment.org here. So um, this is some of the things we talk about in our clinical training. You will have access to these slides. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, you'll, we will make sure that all of you, everyone who registered, gets a copy of the slides. So uh, I want to go ahead and give Dr. Tolzman uh, the um, desktop now. So Louise, you can just click on the share box down at the bottom of your screen and you'll be able to share your slides. Okay. Can you see them? Yeah, and you can go ahead and just put that in uh, present mode. Great. Great. Well, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Um, you know, the, the impetus for this really was the start of the campfire, which uh, started on November 8th, north of Sacramento. Um, it burned, you know, 153,000 acres, almost 14,000 homes, but you'll see there, you know, 4,200 other buildings, right? Lots of ranches, lots of farms. And on the same day, you know, down in, near Los Angeles, the Woolsey fire started. I didn't realize they started on the exact same day. For those of us not in um, California, I think we had a little bit of that sensation like the entire um, state was on fire. Uh, again, lots and lots of structures. Um, historically, when we think about other fires, you know, it's happening more and more. You know, the, we have always had forest fires, right? As long as the planet has been here and there's lots of debate about how that keeps um, healthy forests. But what, what is new is that we're now having forest fires that are also starting to build, you know, burn buildings and burn, you know, farmland and burn structures and industry. And so again, this is what we watched happen down there, right? Not just the forest fires, but we're talking about homes and cars and industry and everything that's inside of that. And so this was the study that just came out in 2018 that was actually looking at the 2015 fires. We had fires up here in Oregon that year and that was, you know, a lot of fires down in California. And this gets to be kind of an uh, epidemiological kind of survey, right? who's showing up at the emergency room and, and how long are they showing up afterwards and what's actually happening. And we get to see that, you know, as you can imagine, right, respiratory issues, cardiovascular issues, asthma, COPD, bronchitis, um, not just aggravations of them, but also new diagnoses of them and an increase in all cause mortality. So a little bit unknown, like what's that about, but people dying. However, if we're going to start talking about what actually happens long term, we have to kind of go back to the firefighters because we don't know what happens long term. We, we can't say what's going to happen to everybody who's been being exposed to all of this. We can say that for the firefighters. So it's the firefighters who really have been at the forefront of um, going into homes that are basically hazmat situations with all the different things burning. And what we're seeing is they are getting cancer, they are getting heart disease, and they are dying from it. So in the long-term picture, I think we have to remember that that's a piece of this puzzle too, is that, um, that we are seeing the immediate surge in ER visits, but we have to remember that there's a long-term cost to this as well. The other piece that I really want to um, just kind of emphasize is that there's actually different types of fires, right? So there's different types of particulates. This was a study actually showing that there's a difference in the particle, the PM10s, from urban PM10s to wildfire PM10s. So 
even though we're talking about data and research and things like that, talking about PM10s, there's actually different things in the PM10s, right? I mean, there's particles. So different things are gonna be attached to it and it's gonna cause different kind of illness. At the same time, the toxicity of the smoke is different. And this, the study down below, the flavors of fire, was actually talking about different forest fires. So they were talking about the difference of, you know, when pine trees burn as opposed to, you know, deciduous trees, that it's actually producing different toxicants, which makes sense, right? I mean, different things are stored in different places. Mm -hmm. um, the third thing that I want to say about the types of fires is that there's also this whole component of how hot is the fire burning. And again, it's not, it's not homogenous. So within a fire, you can have areas where there's less heat and less burning and other places where there's more heat and more burning. And that's gonna result in different toxicants getting released. When there's incomplete combustion, you make a lot of <laughs> and gross toxicants that um, can be a problem. So what's actually in the smoke? Um, this is basically the big picture of what's in the smoke. Everything, you name it, it's in the smoke, right? Particles, various toxic gases, including ozone, solvents, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, toxic metals, herbicides, pesticides, perfluorinated compounds, plastics, PCBs, asbestos. You name it, it's in them. Um, the particles, I, I just want to touch on for a second because I know that Dr. Patrick is going to go into some of the ultrafine particles. But when we talk about particle size, we're talking about, you know, PM10, PM2.5, and then the ultrafines, the less than the 0.1s. PM2.5 really gets all the attention for the most part because that's what's linked with air pollution. So when you go to your phone app and you're looking, you know, what's the air quality today? It's a, it's a hybrid of ozone and your PM 2.5s. Um, however, you can see that part of what's happening with the different particles is they're going to go deeper into the body, right? It makes sense. The bigger the particle, the more on the exterior it's going to stay, the deeper it's going to go deeper into the body. And what we see is that, you know, with the ultrafine particles really are just going straight into circulation with whatever it is that's attached to them, right? Toxic gases, we're talking not just of CO2, which always gets talked about in terms of air pollution and how much have we put into the atmosphere. We're talking about carbon monoxide. We're talking about the nitrogen oxides, the sulfur oxides, ozone, formaldehyde. These things are getting produced as they are being burned from other substances. They are producing these things and then they're interacting with each other. So you have sulfur dioxide and you put a little water, you have other chemical reactions and the next thing you know, you're developing sulfuric acid. Carbon monoxide is actually used by the fire department to track toxicity. So on a fire, um, firefighters get pulled off at various intervals and they go into the rehab truck and they get um, checked, all their vitals get checked and their CO level gets checked. And the assumption is if their CO level is high, they've been being exposed to everything because the assumption is carbon monoxide's there, everything's there. Solvents and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, we're talking benzene, styrene, toluene. I mean, these are normal things that burn even in forest fires, lots of these amounts of solvents, toxic, irritating to the lungs. Um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, so these groups with multiple um, benzene rings all attached, often from incomplete combustion. So again, when, when the fires are in different temperatures and burning different things, they're gonna make more or less polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And the toxic metals, you know, we have thought about the toxic metals as being fairly inert, right? Like you think of them unless they're in the air, unless you're sanding the lead, if it's just in the paint and on the wall and you're not eating it, then maybe you're not gonna be getting it. But that's not the case when we're talking about fire. When we talk about fire, all of this stuff is getting liberated. And, you know, car batteries, cadmium, lead, pressure treated lumber. Think about your fencing. Think about all of the outdoor structures, the back porches. Um, they're all having arsenic, chromium, copper often, various paints with lead, again, fertilizers. So when the 
when the farmland burned, right, you're not just burning the fields, right? Your barns are burning. All Remember those 5,000 other structures? Old industry, so old leaded fuel, industry contamination, and then of course there's the naturally occurring mercury that gets stored in trees that gets liberated and is part of the whole mercury cycle. So in 2007, they actually did a study looking at, there was a fire down um, in Southern California in Sacramento, and they actually started analyzing the ash. And this was after they removed the household hazardous waste, they took that out, they were just sampling ash, and they found high levels of arsenic, cadmium, copper, and lead. And these levels were exceeding the health-based standards. And what we know about this is that it's super absorbable. You've got it in an ash form, right? Inhaling it, ingesting it, it's gonna get into the body. Uh, the top study is talking about lead and mercury emissions from wildfires. And then the bottom one was super interesting. They were actually, they, they were able to look at the lead and identify where it was coming from. And this was old industry. So like leaded fuel that had been banned is in the plants, it's in the soil, it's in the ground. And when that goes on fire, that is all coming back out into circulation. Pesticides and herbicides. So again, farmland, right? The obvious place, but everybody's home often in their basements, <laughs> in their garages is gonna also have herbicides and pesticides potentially. Forests get routinely sprayed for herb with herbicides. They get routinely sprayed with insecticides in order to kind of keep uh, tree growth well as part of their forest, healthy forest management. And then again, the historical use. So banned pesticides, banned herbicides. And that's what we're seeing, stuff coming up. Like it's old, it's supposed to be gone, but it's not gone. It's in the soil, it's in the plants, and it's coming back out. This was an amazing review article actually looking at pesticides and looking at wildfire suppression chemicals in California fires. And one of the things that they were talking about specifically was you need to kind of understand the biochemistry or the toxicity of the pesticide, the parent compound. But that's not the only thing that you're getting exposed to, right? Those parent compounds are getting burned. They are getting transformed before they're turning into smoke and before you're inhaling them. And so some of these really common pesticides, which you know I don't actually think of as that inert, become even more toxic when they get burned. And that's part of what's getting released. The other thing is, is that it really is going into the air. <laughs> so this was a study looking along the, the West Coast and measuring levels of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and pesticides. And it was um, specifically looking at a fire that was happening um, in Siberia. And they were measuring the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and the pesticides. And they were finding elevated levels in the air that they were tracking that had come over the ocean and come here. So these things are getting liberated, they are going into the air, they are going into circulation, and they are depleting the soil area. So the other part of the study is that they, um, they did these things where they measured the pesticide concentration in the soil, and then after a burn, they measured it again. And that pesticide is going away. I mean, that's an amazing way of kind of cleaning the soil, is basically burning it, except for the fact that we're all then having to breathe it. Um, perfluorinated compounds, so again, PFOAs, PFAAs, PFOSs, these are all the things with a fluorine attached to it. So think about your fluorine and your bromine and all the kind of halogens. These are basically flame retardants. So wild, wildfire suppression foams class B, they're in the process of trying to uh, phase those out because they are so toxic and these PFCs don't go away. Um, Teflon pans, right? I mean, a single Teflon pan heated slightly high, doesn't even have to be smoking, is enough to kill birds in the home, right? Who had Teflon pans when these places were burning and how much of that got liberated? As well as like all of the carpeting and furniture is now routinely sprayed with Scotch Guard. You know, firefighter turnouts, they're actually being exposed pretty routinely to perfluorinated compounds because they're in these, you know, non burnable suits. So again, going back to the firefighters, because 
you know, the next question is, well, so this stuff's in the air, did it really get into me, right? How do we know that? So this was a small study, just a little over 100 firefighters in Southern California. And they basically tested them for 12 different PFCs and found that they were three times higher than their matched controls in the NHANES. So it is, it's getting in, it's in the air, it's getting in, it's going into the body. Plastics, right? There is no one plastic. We're talking about polyvinyl chloride, polystyrene, polypropylene, polyurethane, um, and then bisphenols, and then of course all the phthalates and the parabens that get that are used to soften the plastics. And they're burning, right? Vinyl siding, vinyl windows. Think about the irrigation piping outside the home. Think about the plastic tubing that's often inside the home for people's water, their gutter, <coughs> garbage cans, recycling cans, lawn furniture. And then of course, polystyrene is in insulation. Polyurethane is a lot of those couch cushions. And a lot of these plastics, when they're burning, are being transformed into really toxic intermediates that we are then, you know, inhaling. PCBs, you know, we did a great job banning them, but they are still around. They're still in our bodies. They're still in old, pl in old places. They're in caulk that's around, used around windows. Um, in wood floor finish, fluorescent light fixtures, electrical transformers. They're, you know, we detect them. They're actually in all people. And then asbestos. So asbestos was a really great insulator, right? So it doesn't, doesn't really burn. And even in these situations, what they're finding is these little fragments of asbestos that are attached to the particles that we are then inhaling. And, you know, it's still out there, right? It's still an insulation board, it's still in roofing tile, it's still in electrical equipment. So how do we figure out um, what our patients have and uh, what we need to do about it? So it's the, it's the, it's the testing, right? So the toxic metals, the, the, the problem is that we can't really scan anybody, right? So in an ideal world, we'd be able to scan them, we'd say what they have in them, and then you know, we'd know that. But instead, we've got all everybody's pre-existing conditions, everybody's pre-existing load. We've got their own individual SNPs that are gonna determine whether or not they're good at clearing things or not, their own deficiencies. And so all of these things are playing a part in what you're testing. And so it's good to remember what it is that you're testing when you're doing the testing. So with toxic metals, you have to remember the half-lives of the metals. If you don't remember the half-life, you're not gonna know uh, whether what you're seeing is because of the smoke that was just outside or something else. So in cadmium, remember we think of it, we tend to think of it as body burden because it's got such a long half-life, but both lead and mercury, you know, it's gonna be gone in a few months. So if someone comes to you six months from now and wants you to do an unprovoked urine toxic metals, you're not necessarily going to see the lead that they were exposed to a ways back, unless it's still in their home and they're still breathing it through the dust. Um, urine toxic metals through doctor's data. You can also run the toxic elements panel through Genova. Pesticides and herbicides, you've got lots of choices on who to test for. Uh, Genova has a chlorinated pesticide panel. They also run it through Toxic Effects Core. So for those of you that don't know or haven't really worked with Genova, they've got two, they've got this Toxic Effects Core panel that basically has six of these different panels all connected to it. So you can either run them individually or you can run the whole thing in a Toxic Effects Core. So that's when I've listed them there. The organophosphates uh, can be run through Great Plains, through their GPL Tox panel, which is a urine test, or again, Genova individually organophosphates or combined in the toxic effects core. Uh, you can look specifically at the herbicide 2,4-D, either through Great Plains Lab or through NMS Labs. And if you don't know NMS Labs, it's a great lab that uh, does a lot of toxicant testing and they do more than just um, blood and urine, they actually do fat testing. And so if you have a patient that you think is, um, has been exposed to something, you're wondering whether that has gotten stored in the fat because the pesticides and the herbicides really do get stored in the fat. Um, if they're happening to be having surgery, you can always get a little bit of a fat sample and actually have it sent in. I've done that with patients. NMS Labs is your place. 
um, pyrethroids, which is an insecticide through Great Plains Lab, and glyphosate, which I don't really want to say is the active ingredient of Roundup, but it's one of the ingredients of Roundup uh, through Great Plains Lab urine. Uh, phthalates and parabens, again, Genova's phthalate and paraben panel or their toxic effects core. Great Plains has that GPL tox panel. US Biotech also has an environmental pollutants profile and phthalates and parabens are on it. Solvents, again, Genova, volatile solvents and toxic effects core. Great Plains Lab, again, that GPL tox and then US Biotech. The thing I wanna point out here is Genova's using whole blood and the other two are using urine. Uh, PCBs, um, really, I've, I've bolded the ones that are different from each other. So Genova has this PCB profile and it lists those um, nine different uh, PCBs. NMS Labs also has a PCB panel, it's also serum and they do these other ones. So there's a little bit of overlap and a little bit of something different. Um, and then the perfluorinated compounds, this is actually a little bit trickier. In fact, it used to only really be research. You can actually choose individual PFCs through NMS labs, both PFOA and PFAS you can check, but you can also run oxidative stress. And the oxidative stress panel, there's the RBC glutathione level. So looking at that through doctor's data, which is a urine test. You can also check out the 8-hydroxy-2-deoguanosine, which is literally a byproduct of oxidation of the DNA. So you're looking to see how much oxidative stress is happening, what's happening to the DNA. Is the DNA getting damaged? This will be higher. Is the DNA not getting damaged? This will get lower. And this is actually a marker that you can follow and you can track to see what's happening with oxidative stress in this patient. Um, Doctors Data has a panel, it's urine, and Genova also has a panel, it's called the Oxidative Stress Profile, and it is also urine. And I think Dr. Crinian has more to say on this 8-hydroxy to deaguanosine, but um, yeah, that is all I have. Thanks, Dr. Tolsman. We're going to uh, hold questions until the end. So if you want to put your questions in the Q&A area that you all have access to, please feel free to go ahead and do that. Sorry, I just realized that my video turned off. Um, but if you want to go ahead and stop sharing your screen, Louise, I'll go ahead and pull my slides up. I thought I was stop sharing. Mm, I think that you may have. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. All right. So what I'm going to talk about is um, a little bit about the effects, um, but mostly about what we, what we can do, action we can take. I got several email queries uh, right before we went on, um, basically saying the same thing. What are three things I can do right now? To help my friends in paradise and so we will be talking about that um, but first we need to understand a little bit more about the damage in order to find the solution uh, who's most vulnerable most vulnerable are the following children because their lungs have not stopped developing I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on with some studies the elderly because they're uh, dealing with decreased antioxidant function in their lungs, pregnant women and their growing fetuses, because fetuses do receive the um, downstream effects of PM 2.5, uh, exposure to uh, air pollution, especially PM 2.5 and less, which is what PM 2.5 means, um, has been correlated with uh, risk for autism, preterm birth and low birth weight. And then of course the following conditions. Um, well, maybe not of course, you may not think that diabetes is a group of, uh, is a condition that, in, that is, has increased risk for um, uh, being more vulnerable uh, as a result of exposure to building fire and wildfire smoke, but that is absolutely true and it's in the medical literature, as well as all cardiovascular diseases. And uh, I didn't put it in the slide, but obesity. Uh, folks with obesity are more at risk for 
the detrimental effects of wildfire and building fire smoke. What all these conditions have in common is that they are related to systemic antioxidant deficiency. And we're gonna be talking about antioxidants a lot. So as Louise, Dr. Tolzman explained to us, we're really concerned about PM 2.5 and smaller, and especially the ultrafine particles that are 0.1 micromolar micron in diameter. Um, and there's even a, you know, 100 uh, nanometers and less. Um, but really anything 2.5 and below causes systemic inflammation. The EPA has a very good explanation of this for healthcare providers. You can see the link below the slide and their graphic is pretty uh, explanatory. And really the main point of this graphic is that the airborne uh, particulate matter up there on the top left-hand corner that's inhaled into the alveoli of the lung, especially uh, the 2.5, which is, you know, what is in wildfire smoke and building smoke, actually causes systemic inflammation in the body. You can see all the areas that this happens. One of the surprising ones is that PM 2.5 and below causes uh, a imbalance in the sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system so the autonomic nervous system which uh ends up as a systemic excuse me as a sympathetic um, effect and can affect uh, directly uh, car the cardiovascular function via heart rate variability so whether the particles find their way into the systemic circulation by osmosis or whether they're brought in by macrophages or whether they don't even get into the circulation at all and they're just in the alveoli, these particles cause systemic inflammation via oxidative stress. So that's the important thing to remember is that we're really talking about oxidative stress. Uh, these particles, cause an upregulation of the phase one detox enzymes. As Dr. Uh, Tolzman mentioned, increased levels of DNA damage measurable by the 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine urine test, decreased glutathione levels, increased tumor necrosis alpha and interleukin-6, and drive oxidative stress and inflammation. So really the main pathology here is oxidative stress. We know that these 2.5 emissions actually, unfortunately, for most of the world, the uh, fires now, the wildfires exceed coal burning and car exhaust, car exhaust. This was kind of surprising to me when I read this, but it, it is true that in many parts of the world, as a result of climate change, we're getting much of our exposure to air pollution through wildfires. Um, we do know that, uh, specifically the risk group of folks who have pre-existing or underlying cardiovascular disease are significantly at risk for an acute event. What's an acute event? A heart attack or a stroke. Remember that 50% of heart attacks are fatal. So it's a really important area to um, zero in on, to focus on. Um, we know that in California, um, the uh, epidemiological work that was done with the fires in 2015 show that as a result of in these fires in eight different California basins, so both north and south, uh, these fires caused elevated risks for a variety of manifestations of cardiovascular disease, including arrhythmias, heart failure, and strokes. Now, let's talk about the solution. Uh, I, that's, that's why I had to precede the solution with understanding a little bit about oxidative stress because in the lining of the lung fluid, and it's actually called the respiratory tract lining fluid, lives a very high concentration of antioxidants. It's really important to understand this because this is where the solution lies. So you can see here that the low molecular weight antioxidants, means they're small molecules, glutathione, vitamin E, vitamin C, uric acid, you know, usually as doctors, we think uric acid's a bad thing because it causes gout, but it's actually a very 
uh, metabolically efficient antioxidant, meaning it does a lot of work for a little molecule. And alpha tocopherol, which is a component of the big family of vitamin E complex, right? There are also some enzymes that are really important, and we have to support those enzymes to function, to have a good antioxidant function in the lung. Now you can see that this is a European, this is a, uh, this article came out of the UK because of how they spell seruloplasmin. Uh, but there are other metal binding components in the blood, in the lungs, and in the respiratory tract lining fluid that actually bind metals. So keeping the respiratory tract lining fluid healthy is very important. It's not just my opinion. All of the articles looking at asthma, looking at COPD, looking at um, acute respiratory uh, problems uh, are consistent that, uh, and, and asthma, that all of those patient populations have deficient levels of not just glutathione, but uric acid and ascorbic acid, as well as vitamin E. And they're more at risk, this is the important part, they're more at risk from damage from smoke. So what we know is that, you know, the real um, uh, problem with these irritants is that they deplete glutathione, not just in the lungs, but systemically. So both in animal studies and in human studies, especially with asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, these, this patient population is already at risk for glutathione deficiency. You put air pollution or cigarette smoke on top of that, and you have an even further depletion of glutathione, which causes further inflammation, not just in the lung tissue, but systemically. To make matters worse, the new research is showing that single nucleotide polymorphisms, and I'm very specifically talking about the ones that are listed on this slide, play a strong role in response to air pollution. GSTM1 is the most important one. Uh, this is glutathione as transferase, M1. This is really important because 50% of uh, adult Caucasians and children too, it's inherited, um, are glutathione deficient, or, well have this polymorphism, excuse me, they have GSTM1 polymorphism and it increases their risk for glutathione, um, uh, well let me put it this way, inefficient utilization of glutathione. They can't use the glutathione that they have. They become much more sensitive to particulate matter, um, statins have some positive effect, but there are other antioxidants like vitamin E that are also very useful um, in this situation. These are two studies, uh, one of them done in Mexico City with 158 asthmatic kids, showing that um, I think there were about 38% of them had a GSTM1 null genotype, so they don't have the gene, it's a deletion. Uh, they were at increased risk for. Uh, lung function problems, expiratory flow, uh, and increasing them, not just, uh, you know, putting them at risk for asthmatic conditions, but remember that kids' lungs are still growing. And the second study, this was part of the Children's Health Study, and this was done in Southern California, looked at over 2,000 kids and uh, compared the particulate matter they were exposed to with their uh, lung function growth and showed that the kids that had um, problems it, with their SNPs, it was a glutathione synthetase gene SNP, actually had uh, impairment in their ability to develop their lungs. So not only do we have to make sure that antioxidant function um, is uh, optimal by making sure there's sufficient amounts of antioxidant, but we have to be very aware of, and, and uh, I'm going to say screen for the kids who have uh, glutathione synthetase SNPs and GSTM1 null genotypes, because the GSTM1 null genotype 
is going to need uh, antioxidant support uh, to increase the efficiency of the glutathione system. And the children with glutathione synthetase gene SNPs are going to have a problem making glutathione. You know, you can give them all the N-acetylcysteine you want, all the precursors to glutathione, all the glycine and glutamine that you want to, but they can't put those amino acids together to make glutathione. So they actually need a preformed glutathione. So there are a lot of reviews that have been published in the medical literature looking at actually giving supplements, antioxidants, to um, respiratory uh, disease patients and looking at their ability to handle air pollution. And I'm gonna go through just a few of them uh, B vitamins, uh, and specifically folic acid, B6 and B12 in this particular study, uh, were actually able to improve heart rate variability. And that's significant. So what we're saying there is that having adequate levels of B vitamins, and um, this was a study that was actually uh, looking at methylation. So this was a methylfolate not just good old folic acid. And the ability of uh, these three vitamins to support normal methionine, homocysteine, and glutathione production actually had a positive effect on heart rate variability in those that were exposed to ultrafine particles. And yes, you're probably wondering, are people actually being exposed to air pollutants in studies? And yes, they are. They actually are um, able to produce very specific levels of ultrafine particles, including sulfur dioxide, nit um, nitrous oxide, and ozone, and actually subject people to these air pollutants to see what happens. So um, that is not the case with the children's studies. They actually did air pollution monitoring, but they do do that in, in some adult studies. Uh, N-acetylcysteine has been shown to be uh, extremely effective in minimizing damage uh, to exposure to diesel exhaust particles. Diesel exhaust particles, I think Dr. Hernan is going to talk a little bit more about that. But diesel exhaust particles are extremely damaging uh, systemically to us as humans, um, but also to our lung linings and the lung fluid. Uh, there's some evidence from, these are all human studies, none of these are animal studies. There's some evidence from human studies that carotenoids, uh, precursors to vitamin A, specifically lycopene, which is found in high amounts in tomatoes, vitamin D and vitamin E actually minimize the, the uh, damaging effect of pollution um, in asthmatics, those with COPD, and uh, minimizes and protects from the initiation of lung cancer. There's, uh, there's some good randomized control trials looking at very small amounts of vitamin E, 400 to 800 IUs, minimizing the damage from ozone. Vitamin C, um, the studies go anywhere from very small amounts. Uh, the children's studies look at 250 milligrams. The adult studies look at 2 grams, 2,000 milligrams, as well as curcumin and choline um, also have a protective effect. And there's some very good research showing that the higher the serum vitamin C level, the more protective the effect uh, on PM10 exposure uh, for uh, those with asthma and COPD. And um, this was not a supplement study. This was just looking at uh, serum vitamin C levels in people, whether they were taking supplements or not. So we don't have a, a dose response relationship in that study. And then um, fish oil. There are several fish oil studies actually showing a positive effect on heart rate variability. Remember that particulate pollution has a very uh, destabilizing effect on heart rate through the autonomic nervous system. And that fish oil at 1.6 grams of both EPA and DHA a day actually was able to mitigate this damaging effect of air pollution. Uh, and in a trial where they looked at fish oil versus olive oil, that was three grams of either fish oil or three grams of olive oil, um, 
And then, like I said, you know, they're actually exposing human beings to ultrafine particles in these studies. Um, those who were on the fish oil actually were protected, again, in terms of the destabilizing effect of uh, pollution, particulate pollution on heart rate variability. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with heart rate variability, um, it is the actual measurement of um, the heartbeat or the heart rate and the destabilizing effect of pollutants on heart rate variability, which equal a decrease in heart rate variability, actually are linked to a very significant increased risk in having an event, an event meaning a heart attack or a stroke. So heart rate variability, having healthy heart rate variability is very, very important. And then sulforaphane, no lecture about air pollution would be complete without explaining that there are some very good studies that were done in conjunction with Johns Hopkins University in China, in uh, Qidong, which is a very polluted city, looking at utilizing sulforaphane, that's what's in the brassica vegetables and some, some other uh, medicinal herbs, uh, in um, using, and they actually used a broccoli sprout dried powder, but this was produced at Johns Hopkins, and they actually did a lot of the basic uh, bench work in being able to come up with a broccoli seed that was higher in the precursor to sulforaphane than regular broccoli seed. So this was a superfood, really. Um, and what they did is they took this broccoli sprout powder and made it into a drink and gave it to um, several hundred Chinese, and then they looked at, they measured the ability of the antioxidant glutathione, the glutathione as transferase ability, to bind to different pollutants. And they saw significant improvement in people's ability to detoxify air pollutants when they took this broccoli sprout powder. So the important thing to know about that, sulforaphane comes in a capsule. <clears throat> you know, you can get it as a pill. You can also get it in food. Uh, it is available in food, and it is available in broccoli sprouts. The Johns Hopkins research shows that three-day-old broccoli sprouts have the highest levels of glucosinolate, which turns into sulforaphane in your body, in your mouth, in your stomach. Uh, and um, there actually is no downside to taking sulforaphane. Um, it's a very potent uh, phase two upregulator. All right, so I think that is, um, those are my slides. And I think Dr. Crinian, you can pull your slides up. He's muted. Can you see my desktop? Yes, and now we can hear you too. Yay. So Dr. Tolzman and Dr. Patrick covered just beautifully the effect of all the pollutants, primarily talking about the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system. Now, two years ago at the Environmental Health Symposium, we did an entire conference on neuroinflammation and particulate matter fires neuroinflammation. It starts it, it makes it worse. The manifestation of neuroinflammation, mood problems, primarily depression, decreased cognition all the way to Alzheimer's, and all the chronic neurologic diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autism, ADHD, uh, motor neuron disease, all those things are part and parcel. Now, individuals who've been through the fire, obviously there's a lot to be depressed about, right? And they've got PTSD going as well, which fits in the neuroinflammation. So I wanted to share this article with you. I'm going to do one article on treatment and one on prevention. I want to share this one article with you 
Those of you who are subscribers to my monthly Crinian Opinion Update, you heard this from last month, but I really believe this is a blockbuster study. It totally blew my mind. Now this was done in the military. This was done in military personnel who got basically blown up by IEDs. And the medics there would give them, depending upon where they, um, if they you know, were in the placebo group or not, were given either NAC, just NAC, for seven days, just seven days of NAC or placebo. And the outcome measure that they looked for was, did their brain manifestations of traumatic brain injury turn around? Dizziness, hearing loss, headache, memory loss, sleep problems, neurocognitive dysfunction, it's all neuroinflammation. Traumatic brain injury stays around because of neuroinflammation. And what they give them? Four gram loading dose. And they did four grams a day for the first few days, then dropped it to three grams a day. The odds ratio for those service members who got four grams of NAC for five days and three grams for two days, a low cost, safe product, their odds ratio for having no symptoms, zero symptoms of traumatic brain injury at the end of seven days, 3.6. 3.6 fold more likely to have no manifestation of traumatic. You know how long it takes to get over traumatic brain injury? Months. If you've worked with people who've had a motor vehicle accident, this, the implications of this are just so, so powerful. So this is a, another part of this particulate matter. But Dr. Patrick also showed you the article on NAC with diesel exhaust particles. Now I'm gonna run through just a few other things about NAC, I'm not gonna stop. I'm just gonna run through them. But NAC is probably the most fantastic antitoxicant supplement that we have and that we probably don't use. It's good for cigarette smoke, particulate matter 2.5, diesel exhaust particles, that's DEP, trichloroethylene solvent, rotenone, induced Parkinson prevention, acute organophosphorus uh, pesticide poisoning, aluminum phosphide poisoning, endosulfan, which is a chlorinated pesticide, malathion, which is an organophosphate, methyl ethyl ketone, acetaminophen, the phthalates, DEHP and MEHP, bisphenols, perfluoral compounds, all the things that Dr. Tolzman showed you were in the smoke, NAC is shown to prevent damage from. Aflatoxins, and, oh, and just a few metals, arsenic, cadmium, chromium-6, mercury, and lead. So really keep in mind NAC. I think, it's, I think it really should be far higher on our list of go-tos. I know we're all enamored with the liposomal glutathione as I am. I take it every single day. Now I have added in NAC as well into my daily regimen. So an astounding possibility of with a high dose I've never given that level of NAC before, ever, four grams a day. I've never even considered it. But if it can do that for traumatic brain injury from an IED, what can it do for other neuroinflammation? What can it do for your cardiovascular and respiratory tract? I, I mean, I think we got to find out. This is, this is too good to pass up. Now, both Dr. Patrick and Dr. Tolzman talked a lot about, about the particulate matter. These fires aren't going to stop. These fires are going to keep happening. You've been paying attention. You know that fires have been going on in greater amounts in this country and in other countries. Last summer, I was up in Seattle helping my, my uh, daughter and son-in-law do some construction. And 
the smoke from all the fires in Western Washington, the sun was orange at noontime. Now I have shared this particular article more than once. It was a study where they went into a house and they used different types of furnace filters. They used some of the one inch thick furnace filters, MERV 4, 6, and 11, and they used some of the five inch thick filters, MERV 10, 13, and 16. Now I want you to look at the amount of ultrafine particle removal that occurred from these filters. Now remember, ultrafine is the most damaging of all the particulate matter it makes. It's found in the mitochondria, in the neurons, in the brain. It makes it throughout. And whatever chemical was incinerated at the same time as that ultrafine particle was made are carried by that ultrafine particle into wherever it goes, okay? So look at the one inch filters, a MERV 4, 0% UFP reduction, a MERV 6, getting better, oh, 10%, a MERV 11, 15% UFP reduction, but it dropped the airflow by 8%. Now look at the five inch thick filters, and just let's just go up to the top one, MERV 16, 60 to 80% UFP reduction with only a 6% drop in airflow. Now, most of the, if, if you're in an apartment like I am, you can't do this. It, it's, you just put in the little, you know, one inch thick things in, in the ceiling and call it good, you can't do this. If you're in a home with an HVAC system, check it out. Many of those systems are made to hold a five inch thick filter, or it can be retrofitted. Now, the filters cost about 100 bucks on Amazon, somewhere in there, you know, between 75 and 130. You can get, you know, a five pack there for, you know, a good price. It will drop all those UFPs, 60 to 80%. It's also going to dramatically drop the PM 2.5. Now, you've been hearing me talk about IQ errors for a long, long time. But if you're in an area, where there's smoke. If you had smoke this year, you're gonna likely have smoke next year. Seriously consider using this type of filter in your HVAC unit. If it doesn't fit it, just call up the local HVAC company. Hey, what would it cost her to refit this? You will drop your exposure dramatically. Now, there's only been one doctor I know who did this. He had read my section in the clinical textbook, Environmental Medicine, and he put it in. And he was telling me about his experience with it. And one of the things was that they've had trouble with their refrigerator getting packed up the, on the back of the refrigerator, the, the coils getting covered with, with dust, and it actually blew out their refrigerator one Thanksgiving. So that, Ever since then, they've been pulling it out once a year and cleaning it off. Well, this year, he said, hey, you know what? I pulled it out, and there wasn't any dust on it after having the MERV 16 in their house. There was no dust on it. Well, what is carried in the dust? All of the semi-volatile organic compounds, the phthalates, the bisphenols, the pesticides, the perfluorocarbons, all those things that Dr. Tolzman has talked about. So your intake of all these things is going to be dramatically reduced. I strongly urge you to seriously consider this as a great preventive method. Our medicine still includes prevention. So that's what I have to offer. Great. So, um, Walter, we're gonna, I'm going to start from the bottom with the questions. Um, and there are many, many questions about NAC, but one of them is, what is your daily dose? What do you take? Every I do day? two grams a day. Okay. I, was I live in the Phoenix Valley, which is a polluted valley. And I also happen to like to eat uh, Alaskan red salmon once a week, typically. And so I'm getting double duty with that. 
get yeah remember when salmon had no mercury in it mm. remember the good old days yeah no longer <laughs> Um, the next question is about reflux, how to combat the horrible reflux from NAC. It's dose specific. So it would mean decreasing the dose and doing it more often. Remember that what NAC does, why uh, mucomist is the trade name for the, drug, the N-acetylcysteine that's used in the emergency room um, that's inhaled. Uh, to get mucus out of the uh, lungs of usually older folks who have uh, chronic bronchitis. It's because it is a mucolytic. So NAC acts as a mucolytic in the lining of the stomach, as well as it can act as a mucolytic in the lungs, which is a good thing. It's not a good thing when it does that in the stomach, but it's absolutely dose um, dependent. So, uh, you know, Walter, I, I don't know how they dose that four gram per day loading dose? Did they do that like QID or five I times? I do not remember. Yeah, but I would imagine that it was a multiple dose. Multiple it was dose. a multiple dose, that much I do remember, but I can't remember yeah. the exact amount that they gave. Yeah. They might have been 500 milligram um, capsules. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, Kelly Bender asked, so for those of us in apartments, IQ air filter is not sufficient. Oh, yes, it is. That's what I have. I'm in an apartment, and I have an IQ air filter in my bedroom. That's so what I, I do. Are you recommending, though, to use the MERV 16s in addition to the IQ air? Yeah, if I had a house that I could fit the MERV 16 in, I would fit it in. And then I wouldn't need to use my IQ air as much. Mm -hmm. I really wouldn't, you know, but... I, ha I have to use my IQ air because I can't put a MERV 16 in. Right. And can you explain the retrofitting issue? So in a house where you've got an HVAC unit, typically in the garage, maybe the basement, there's a place where the filter fits in, the furnace filter. Many of the times they're right on the very bottom on one side. You can open up a little door and put it in. And, or on the side, and that's where, if it can, if it's a newer unit, it's very likely to have already the space for the five-inch filter. So you just need to go down and look. And if you haven't looked at your furnace filter in a while, you got to take better care of your furnace. Yeah. So if if there is no opportunity for retrofitting or fitting that five-inch filter. That's when you got. Then you got to do the IQ yeah. air. Yeah. You got to get as many IQ airs as you need for your uh, square footage. <clears throat> okay, um, Doctor Tolsman, there's a question for you about. Um, do you remember when you were showing the GPL versus Genova testing? Um, I think it was uh, solvents. The solvent panel looking at urine versus blood. It was the um, chlorinated. Pesticides, I think. Mm, can you, would you be willing to go back in your slides just to show yeah. us, please? Uh, because the question from the doc is, when the first doc was comparing GPL and Genova, she mentioned Genova was a serum test and GPL was a urine test. Mm -hmm. Does one show, or, show more free or bound, or are there other differences between the info from the other two types of tests? You're right, it was the solvent panel. Yeah, so um, Dr. Morales, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is what you're referring to. Please type your uh, question in if you can and, and let us know we're on the right track here. Um, because you did mention, in the question she mentioned pesticides, but I think this was the slide right. she was referring to. So right. pesticides have a variety of urine and serum, but they're looking at different things. So the organophosphates are in the urine from both companies. Um, and the chlorinated is serum, but it is the solvents where I pointed out the discrepancy. I don't know, Dr. Crinian, what are your thoughts? I, I, when I run the toxic effects core, I, you know, I haven't done any split samples, which I kind of feel like we'd almost have to do to be able to see it. Well, I have found that with individuals who are sleeping on a memory foam mattress that the GPL 
urine test does show higher metabolites of benzene and styrene. So I have seen that. Otherwise, I typically have gone with the blood test for the solvents because I want to know what is, what it is, it, are there solvents in the blood that the body can't clear out? Because mm -hmm. if there aren't solvents, metabolites in the urine, is that because they weren't exposed or because they can't clear it out? And if right. there's a high amount, is it because they're overexposed or they're, they've got induced biotransformation? So I still have questions about the urine test, but when solvents are present in the blood, that individual's got a serious problem because aromatic solvents are not supposed to be in there. Right. They're supposed to be cleared. Mm -hmm. Okay. I hope that clears that up. Um, nebulizer glutathione treatment for post-smoke exposure. Walter, do you want to take that one? That's a good thought. You mm -hmm. know, um, I would add in the nebulized glutathione with that because the breathing of the smoke just robs the lungs of glutathione. Breathing any high pollutant robs the lungs of glutathione and you got to be repleting it. Yeah. And you know, one, one thing that I learned preparing for this webinar is there are a myriad of studies that show that the first antioxidants to be depleted post exposure to ozone are vitamin C and believe it or not, uric acid. The body then tries to rebound by increasing levels of vitamin C, pulling it out of the serum and glutathione, pulling it out of the serum as well. Uh, and thus the kind of systemic depletion of these antioxidants. Um, but I don't want to forget, I want anyone listening to forget about vitamin C as a very, very important antioxidant. And that the lungs, just like glutathione, the lungs become vitamin C depleted with exposure to uh, ozone and particulate matter. All right. Okay, Dr. Tolzman, are you ready for this question? I don't know. This is a trick question. If a patient can only afford one test set, which would be the go-to? <laughs> it's kind of a trick question because I think part of what we're doing is trying to figure out what their exposure is, right? So, mm. so it depends on what they've come in and what they've done. I mean, I really, really like the, the eight-page intake, right, that Dr. Walter Crinian made that, that got hammered out a little bit at the last conference, even more so, in terms of being able to look at timeline. If I'm just shooting in the dark, I mean, then I tend to actually do the Genova core because that's six different, I'm getting shots at six different um, systems or six different toxicant families. Um, but if I, if I have an idea, I mean, I've, I've run, you know, NMS labs on fat sample because I, there was something I was looking for. The patient had an exposure. I was thinking it was linked to what they were about to have surgery for. I got that surgeon to give me some fat. We sent it to NMS. So sometimes you can be a little bit more pointed and more tailored. Can I chime in? Yes, please. If it was just one test that I could do, I would do the urinary 8 OHDG that just shows mm -hmm. overall oxidative damage to the DNA. And then I would work to... Um, rebalance their antioxidant balance, get them out of the oxidative stress. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about 8-OHDG is when their exposure is dropped, that 8-OHDG is going to go down. So it's a marker for how many pollutants have they been exposed to, basically all the pollutants. So I would be following that. Yeah. Okay, we have a question here about sauna, um, and uh, to her credit, this individual actually discloses that she works for Clear Light Infrared. So um, thank you for that disclosure. I, I really love that transparency. Um, and says she works with firefighters and police officers. Uh, and absolutely, there are good clinical studies that show that sauna improves the urinary levels of uh, heavy metals, specifically cadmium, pesticides, solvents, uh, herbicides, etc. So sauna is absolutely a useful, and I'm going to posit perhaps necessary 
lifestyle uh, intervention that that we all um, will benefit from. Um, and I think uh, one of the issues that I've been researching recently is that um, if a sauna is infrared, it needs to be EMF protected. And so I know um, that there are certain manufacturers that actually do work very diligently to protect um, right. their technology from uh, EMF, EMR exposure. Um, so uh, you can you can find that for your patients. Yeah, the only the only problem with the sauna and the cleansing is what Dr. Jenis showed that it doesn't clear perfluoro compounds. Mm -hmm. So it seems to clear everything else, but not perfluoro compounds. Mm -hmm. And polybrominated. Wasn't that the other one? Polybrominated flame retardants? I feel no, like it, did, it did PBDEs, it did? but it doesn't do perfluorocarbons and okay. probably doesn't do organophosphate pesticide because those right. just pee right out in the urine. Probably doesn't do glyphosate because it's peed right out in the urine. Um, but even the, the things that are supposed to not stay around long like phthalates and bisphenol some of those do come out in the sweat but no perfluoro compounds you just really need to avoid those there is a question here about the molecule k-u-l-e air filter i'm not familiar with that any of the panels i believe that we have covered that more than once in the environmental medicine facebook page it is if i recall right we just went over it again it's a hydroxyl ion generator which unfortunately those end up uh, increasing the level of ozone in the uh, dwelling. And, and if you're not convinced that ozone is a toxicant after listening to this webinar, um, I can send you to many others, but that is a, the EPA recommends against ozone-based air filtration methodologies because ozone is such an irritant um, some of the research in Mexico City now is looking at uh, lung damage in children, uh, in young children, as a result of ozone exposure. And so ozone, even though certainly it can be applied to other parts of the body with benefit, it's not something that appears to be beneficial to put in lungs. Um, I think we may have covered everything. If you have a question that didn't get answered, if you could please retype it in the question section. Oh, brands of NAC, glutathione, and other supplements that you recommend. <clears throat> NAC is generic. Doesn't matter who. Yeah, makes it. yeah. All the all the good all the good companies have good NAC, and it's very low cost. Mm -hmm magic about it right and glutathione if it's not liposomal uh, oral glutathione is broken down by stomach acid into its component amino acids and uh, there's not good research to show that those amino acids are recombined back into glutathione inside the white blood cells uh, of the body um, so uh, liposomal glutathione uh, there are good clinical studies on liposom liposomal glutathione but show that it does increase um, white cell and red cell levels. Um, oh, interesting, 8-OHDG is now part of the Dutch test. That's fascinating. It is, it is part yeah. of the Dutch test. Mm -hmm. uh, where to get uric acid? Um, it, uric acid is a, a metabolic product of your own biochemistry. You can't take it. Uh, it doesn't come in a pill. Uh, is there better detox with infrared sauna before colonic or the other way around? You want to take that question, Walter? Is there better detox with infrared sauna? Well, I guess it kind of depends on what you're saying with detox. Saunas reduce the circulating level of pollutants in the bloodstream, and I think they drop the endotoxin level dramatically. Saunas enhance the excretion by the through the skin for pollutants that are in the subcutaneous fat, internal fat pads, you know, move over, you know, dump over as well. Uh, prime, you know, it's really an excellent method for persistent organic pollutants. So mm -hmm. if one is, has POPs, it's an excellent method for that. It's not, as I said, doesn't work for the perfluoro compounds, less effective for 
the non-persistence, you know. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, I do saunas and I do colonics, so there you go. Um, there's one more uh, that I didn't get a chance to talk about, and I just want to talk about it briefly. There's a question about the Santa Susana Field Labs. Uh, so for those of you in Southern California, you know that the Woolsey's fire actually started at the Santa Susana Field Lab. That is a nuclear site that's been a super fun site that has not been cleaned up. Um, and there is concern about release of uh, radioactive materials from that site. There is a nuclear uh, forensic scientist who has received dust samples uh, pre the event, he has dust samples pre the event and dust samples, air samples basically post the Woolsey fire. His uh, name is um, Marco Kaltofen, K L T O F E N, and his um, Twitter address is uh, hashtag SSFL for Santa Susana Field Laboratory, capital S, capital S, capital F, capital L. He's gonna be publishing the results of his dust analysis as soon as he runs them. Um, I just was communicating with him on Twitter today and he's gonna post that on his Twitter feed. Uh, if, there is, if it shows that there is significant emission of uh, plutonium, cesium, thorium, et cetera, uh, then we will do another webinar. That's one of the things that, um, that I've lectured about in the past is what to do to mitigate uh, radioactive uh, exposure uh, via dust, via air. So um, please stay tuned. Uh, we, will, we may be sending out more information. We'll be blogging about that and sending out more information. Uh, prevention, lastly, we can take one more quick question. Um, I'm a, uh, this is for Dr. Crinian. I'm a wildland fire scientist. Prescribed burning typically saves the majority of the PM 2.5 emissions when compared with wildfires for the same forest acres. Rx, I assume that means therapeutically, burning burns up the kindling so that the large logs cannot ignite and smolder. Smoldering duff litter and large logs create most of the PM 2.5 in forests. Um, oh, this is a political question. Are you supportive of prescribed burning as a primary means of reducing annual wildfire emissions in your communities? Yeah, I don't think that this is really germane to our, it's a great topic and I think it's a wonderful discussion to have, but it's really not what we're talking about here, which is yeah. helping people stay healthy. And nor are we wildfire scientists. So it sounds like that looks like Paul, that is actually your area of expertise. You would probably be the best person. So thank you all for joining us. It's uh, late and um, we really appreciate your attention. We will be sending out a copy. We will be posting a, a copy of this webinar recording on both of the EHS and the NAEM websites as well as sending all of the attendees a copy of our PowerPoints um, as soon as we can get them to you. So thank you all very much. Um, go out and uh, be good healthcare providers. <laughs>